speak with you about Korean history. Um, when I started studying Korean history in the United States, it was, I, I was one of very few students who were actually um, genuinely interested in, in studying this. And so it has been a long road uh, to get here, but um, it's, it's just so exciting to see that there is this interest in Korean studies and Korean history uh, abroad that has developed and expanded. And so to be able to come all the way to Manila in the Philippines and to, and to speak to an international audience, it's, it's really um, exciting and, and satisfying for me. So, so thank you again. Thank you again to the organizers for all your hard work. I know how much work it is to, to organize something like this. Okay, so uh, just just by way of my own curiosity, how many of you have have actually studied a little bit about Korean history? One, two, three, okay, four, perfect. Okay, so um, my, my lecture today is just to give you sort of a brief overview of the modern period. Um, this is probably most relevant to your students, I would say, uh, and, and for how you can incorporate uh, aspects of Korean history into your curriculum. So I, I've chosen these particular topics. Uh, this, these topics and um, the, the topics that I'll discuss today, it, in my university, for my students, this covers an entire semester. <laughs> so I really had to condense it and to um, choose some of the bullet points. Um, unfortunately, because so much happened during this time period, uh, it, it's impossible to get into great detail about what happened. But if uh, I will reserve the latter part of the time for question and answer. So if we have other questions and would like more detailed answers, then I'd be happy to attempt to answer those for you. So, um, when I conceived of this lecture and the way that I've structured it is there, even though there, Korea and the Philippines do not have a lot of shared history, uh, there is a lot of, of common history. So what I mean by that is there, there hasn't been a lot of interaction between uh, the Korea and the Philippines, especially compared to, uh, let's say, Korea and China, or Korea and Japan, or Korea and, and the Northeast Asian region. Uh, but there are uh, very significant similarities and parallels that can be drawn between the two countries that I think that uh, would be helpful for you in, in your own development of your curriculum. Um, and just echoing what, what Vice President Cruz said just a moment ago uh, about trying to uh, understand that we are part of this larger global community. Um, and while we, we are different, we are, we are all individuals and we are all unique, we also have, we share a lot of things in common. And so uh, it's important for us as, as educators and as uh, international citizens to, to understand both of those aspects and to try to uh, incorporate um, the, the similarities. And we may not see at the outside, that, at the outside that there are quite a few similarities, but I think as we go through the lecture, we can see that the end that there are. So, um, for example, the Philippines and, and Korea are both uh, relatively small countries. Um, they both have uh, a colonial experience, and they both have um, had difficulties and challenges as a result of imperialism entering into this part of the world. Um, and out of the colonial experience, we see uh, uh, 
development of independence movements and independence fighters. Uh, and then um, there's also, in both countries, uh, a, there was very high influence from the United States. Uh, and uh, after World or during World War II, also uh, occupation by the Japanese. Um, there's a shared or a, a common history of military dictatorships and also um, the, the two countries going through a democratization process. And, and in terms of the latter part of that, it's, um, I'm mostly referring to South Korea. So um, if you can maybe, and I'll, I'll point this up to you as we go along, but as uh, if you can perhaps keep these in mind, these, these points of shared and common um, experiences, historical experiences, um, perhaps this is something that you can use to, uh, as, as a meaningful point of comparison for your students uh, to show that even though we come from different regions and different cultures, that we still have these common experiences and um, can, can contrast and compare. All right, so uh, to get started, Uh, at the time of the late 19th century, so 
So we have uh, British, the British who have established an imperial presence, uh, the, the French who have also established an imperial presence. Uh, as you know, the United States was starting to establish an imperial presence in the region as well. Uh, Germany, France, and Russia. Uh, Russia had consolidated its empire, at, which extended all the way across into uh, East Asia. And, and once they once they made a southern movement, and this this really began to concern Korea and Japan especially because of the proximity of the expanding Russian empire uh, into East Asia. And so as a result of this, we have the Qing Dynasty who has established relations with the Joseon Dynasty. They're very interested in what is going to happen in Korea. Uh, Japan also very interested to see what's going to happen in Korea. Uh, the Russians are interested in Korea. Do, does anybody know why the Russians would be interested in Korea? Your guesses. Russians be interested in tiny little Korea. Well, the Russians did not have a warm water port. So most of the ports were iced over. Uh, and so they're interested in, in this area to try to establish a presence and, and um, establish a warm water port. And so we see them um, slowly encroaching down into this area. Uh, and this, you know, having a warm water port had, had many, many benefits for, for the Russians. Um, but the, the consolidation of the Russian Empire, it, it really concerned uh, the British Empire in particular. The British Empire, which was the largest empire, was, was on its decline, the Russian Empire was was expanding, and so th this was this was a concern for the British. Uh, so, even though Korea, in terms of size, is small, its geographic location was strategic. And so, you have all of these different countries who are interested to see what's going to happen in Korea uh, as a result. Now, uh, eventually, what happened? Uh, the, the Chinese and the Japanese went to war in Korea. That was 1894 to 1895, and the Japanese defeated the Chinese. And then 10 years later, they went to the Japanese went to war with the Russians, again for uh, influence over Korea. And this happened in 1904 to 1905. And then they defeated the Russians in the Russo-Japanese War. Once they defeated the Russians, uh, and they had already defeated the Chinese. There, there wasn't really anybody to contest uh, the Japanese influence in Korea. The Japanese had been savvy enough to uh, uh, form uh, an official, a formal alliance with the British and, and then also later with the Americans. And so the Japanese, then they established Korea as a protectorate in 1905 and the form of an annex Korea in so the colonial period, which lasted between 1910 and 1945, it's, it's not a long period, about 35, 36 years, um, but it's still quite a source of contention between the two countries, between Japan and Korea. I'm sure you're, you're well aware that the, the Koreans are not particularly fond of the Japanese. Uh, the political structure of the colonial period is, uh, at its apex, there was a governor general. And the governor general behaved almost like a, a dictator. He reported directly to the Japanese emperor. So he didn't have to go through the parliament, but he went, he reported directly to the Japanese emperor. Uh, at the beginning of the colonial period, there were about 10,000 bureaucrats in the colonial structure, um, which in itself is, is quite big, because if you think about the Joseon dynasty, 
uh, at, at the largest, at, at, the, at its largest, the, the Joseon administrative structure included about 6,000 bureaucrats. So from the very beginning, colonial administrative structure was quite large. Um, and this would expand to about 87,000 bureaucrats over the period. Um, and it also included about 60,000 police. So this was a much more invasive system than Koreans had been accustomed to. Um, they, they just uh, had never seen anything like this before. Uh, Korea's role in the, the system was, um, they, they didn't have real political power, they had more of an advisor, advisory role. Uh, the socioeconomic structure of the period. The Japanese were interested in promoting industry uh, and developing in infrastructure for economic development, including railroads, roads, telegraphs, uh, telephones, and a banking system. But one thing to remember is that Korea being a colony of Japan, the, the development of the colonial economy was, was done in such a way to benefit the empire, the Japanese empire. So yes, there most certainly was economic development in Korea, but it was limited and in some way skewed because the colony exists for the empire and it exists to support the empire, not the other way around. So, what we see then is uh, in the 1920s and the 1930s, there's quite a bit of industrialization in Korea. Uh, light industry we were owned by both Korean and Japanese companies, but the heavy industry, these were all owned by Japanese companies. Uh, some of the limitations to this were there was there were railroads that were built, but these railroads went in a northwest or north-south direction. Uh, this is because, again, this was most beneficial for, for the Japanese Empire. Um, you have, as, as the Japanese islands, they form in this direction, uh, and they need access from these port entries in Busan and Wonsan mainly. Uh, we have the development of industry in the northeast areas of Korea. Uh, again, this is, this is due to proximity to the empire. Uh, in terms of management of these industries, there were strict limitations. As you can imagine, the top management positions were given to Japanese, uh, and the Koreans then formed the lower echelons of, of the work structure. that shows that uh, 
Um, much of the land that was turned over to the colonial authorities, these were either owned by the Korean government or the Korean royal household. Um, and because the Korean government no longer existed, now obviously the Japanese state, the colonial state, would take these lands over. Um, but in the end, the Japanese became the largest landowners in, in Korea. Um, and uh, although they, they pushed for industrialization and building infrastructure, uh, the Japanese were not interested in changing the social uh, structure or the socioeconomic structure uh, of Korea. So the, the, land, the feudal landlord-tenant system was maintained during this time. And uh, there was eventually a, expansion of growth for the landlords. So as the demand for production of rice and the sell of rice increased, then landlords were able to um, extract more from the tenant farmers who were, who were farming their land. And so what we see then is at the beginning of the colonial period, there is these class differences between landlords uh, and, and, and tenant farmers and peasants. But this, this division it becomes exacerbated uh, during the course of the colonial period and the, the um, condition for peasants deteriorated. So particularly during the Great Depression in the early 1930s when the rice market collapsed, um, this was an extremely difficult time for Korean peasants. Um, they were required to pay something like 50% of the harvest just as rent. Um, so, so we see a continued deterioration uh, for the peasants. The ideological structure of colonial Korea, uh, the Japanese preserved many Confucian values during this time. So ideas such as loyalty to the emperor, loyalty to the empire, uh, which is then manifested in emperor worship or going to Shinto shrines and showing respect to the emperor, um, the imperial rescript. There's um, uh, an emphasis on filial piety. Uh, and so the, the ideological structure was something that was familiar to Koreans on one level and thus preserved, but it also um, very much served the needs of, of the empire. And this becomes even more intense as we move into the wartime era uh, in the 1930s, where this very strict loyalty uh, to, to the Japanese empire is required of all imperial subjects in Japan. Of course, there were supporters of the empire. Um, there, there were those who, who you know, felt that, well, this is, this is our reality, and this is, this is how it's going to be. Japan was the, the strongest entity in the region. Uh, they, they had uh, expanded their empire and were controlling large uh, areas uh, and Korea was right in the middle of this and played a very strategic role in the empire in general and so for many Koreans that was their reality and um, they could not have imagined that, that things would change very dramatically at the end of World War II uh, but so there were these many uh, supporters of the empire but the control of Korea definitely intensified and increased during the wartime years um, when there was a need to mobilize for the wartime efforts, mobilize workers, mobilize resources. And um, there's an infamous name order where Koreans were uh, forced to change their names from Korean names into Japanese names. This is still, again, a, a source of very much bitterness and resentment uh, among Koreans. So, but this did not occur until later, in the, in the later part of the colonial period. 
Uh, and then there was also much resistance to the colonial authorities. Um, many, much of the resistance had to move outside of Korea because the police force and the colonial authorities, they were um, quite pervasive and they were able to control, um, especially after the March 1st movement. But many of these resistance movements moved outside of Korea, so into places like China, Manchuria, and Russia. Um, there, there are these so-called righteous armies, and they were like guerrilla movements. They would base themselves in the mountains, and then they would come down, and they would attack, and then retreat back. Um, and this is also about the time when we have these uh, independence activists who were exposed during their stays in China, Manchuria, and Russia to communist ideology. Uh, so the, the myth of Kim Il-sung, the first leader of North Korea, um, the myth of Kim Il-sung is that he was this independence fighter and he was fighting the Japanese in, from Manchuria and then later on moved into Russia to become properly educated and trained. Um, and, and, and so this is, this is part of his credentials for being the leader of North Korea. Uh, in 1919, there was uh, the largest nationalist movement in Korean history up until this time, March 1st, and So we are now nine years into the colonial period. Um, the second to last king, King Hojong, had died. And Koreans were not allowed to gather in large groups or in groups of more than three people. So the only exception to this was at the churches. They gathered in churches, but other than that, they were not allowed to gather in large groups. Why? Because the Japanese were afraid that they would start plotting against the colonial authorities. Um, this time there was an exception. So they were going to hold a state funeral and the colonial authorities said, okay, Koreans from all over the country can come up to Seoul and pay their respects to their deceased king. Uh, and so this was an exception. And independent activists decided they were going to use this opportunity to stage a nationwide demonstration that protested Japanese colonial authority. Uh, and so this took place two days before the funeral was suggested or, or, was, was, or was scheduled. They then uh, declared Korean independence. They were uh, immediately arrested but the, the copies of the Declaration of Independence had been dispersed and uh, there were other readings and declarations of this independence throughout Seoul, including amongst um, students. And so this movement, this independence movement, gradually spread throughout the country. And uh, over a million people participated, young, old, men, women, from all different classes, and this was really the first cohesive nationalist movement that we saw in Korea. Now, this completely took the Japanese colonial authorities by surprise. They were not prepared for, for not just this, but also the scale of which this occurred. And as a result, they overreacted in their suppression of the demonstrations. And so the brutal suppression uh, of this was um, really quite severe. We have records of this from American missionaries. There are quite a few American Christian missionaries uh, in Korea at the time. And uh, they were writing letters back to their mission boards in the United States, uh, 
describing what was going on in Korea. And uh, one of the accounts was in a rural, rural village. So the Japanese colonial authorities, they, they rounded up all of the Koreans in that village. They put them all in a Christian church, locked the doors, and burnt the church down, killing everybody inside, young, old, women, and children. Um, and so it, it was that kind of brutality that uh, as, as reports slowly started leaking out of the country and um, into the, the press, the media, and there was this, this intense international criticism of, of the Japanese reaction to this movement because the, the Koreans were actually um, very peaceful in their demonstrations. It was a non-violent movement. Uh, and so, and so this, then um, the, the Japanese have forced them to change their, or modify their colonial policy in some way. But this inspired other independence uh, activities. There was a provisional government of Korea that was established in Shanghai. Uh, Sinan Ri and a, a wide variety of Koreans became involved in this. So we have uh, on the political structure, spectrum, those on the right and on the left that participated, but it eventually became um, very right-wing and conservative uh, because the political differences were just too great. Uh, there were also resistance groups in the United States. Uh, Sigmund Rhee, he, he believed that uh, independence could be achieved with the help of foreign powers, particularly in the United States. So he had hoped that the United States would get involved and uh, intervene in order to help Koreans reclaim independence. Um, Tamo believed that, uh, yes, Koreans needed to regain independence, but this could only occur gradually. Um, that they needed to gradually um, take back independence, whereas Hap Yongman, he believed that independence needed to forcefully be taken back through military strikes on the Japanese Empire. He tried to uh, establish a military academy and an Air Force Academy, but uh, none of these really uh, gained any traction, but at least kept the hope of, of independence alive. Okay, so economic policies during the colonial period, as I mentioned, there was an expansion of industry, uh, also manufacturing. Uh, if you look, uh, some of the numbers in 1931, manufacturing made up about 17 or 18 percent of the economy. By 1939, so now we are well into the wartime period, uh, manufacturing made up 40 percent of the colonial economy. So, so what we see in 1939 in Korea is very different from 1910. It's a very, it's, it looks very, very different. And, um, the, the economy at this point now has been so thoroughly, thoroughly integrated into the Japanese imperial economy, it's, it's almost difficult to separate them out. So, so because the, the, the economies were, were so integrated between Korea, Japan, um, Manchuria, and other parts of the empire, this, this is all working in the, the imperial machine. Uh, some of the social effects uh, we had were with the expansion of manufacturing, there are now many uh, factory jobs. Peasants are moving and uh, they are going to different areas to get these jobs. And um, there's also the development of mining and other extractions. Uh, there was uh, the discovery of high-grade iron ore in northern parts of Korea. Um, and so you know, the development of ore and timber extraction, uh, gold, tungsten. Um, and when we get into the wartime economy, there is a heavy emphasis on chemicals, tools, and metal manufacturing. These are all to feed the wartime machine, the Japanese 
you have to produce weapons, and, um, tanks, and other things that are necessary for the war. And so all of these things correspond to that. Uh, if you look at the Korea here, Japan is here, and then as, as the Japan had established itself in Manchuria, they did not colonize Manchuria, but they had established a puppet state there. Um, and with this, we see that Korea now uh, plays an even more important role in the imperial economy here. And between 1930 to 1940, there are over a million workers Abroad. Um, I mean, they're not moving really abroad because they're all within the empire, so they're just moving to different parts of the empire. But approximately 700,000 had moved to Japan, 600,000 to Manchuria. Um, but after 1939, there was this compulsory or forced movement of labor uh, for the wartime efforts uh, of about a million workers. High urbanization, so um, population of cities increased by uh, many times. So again, when we get to late 1930s, 1940s, uh, Korea looks very, very different from what it used to look like, especially in the urban areas. Kelmsong, which is the, um, the colonial name for Seoul, the capital, in 1925, had a population of about 343,000. By 1942, over 1 million. There's this dramatic increase in the population and inflow of, of migrants into the city. Uh, and then the domestic, a uh, movement of domestic labor to other parts of the expanding Japanese empire. Okay, so. In order to accommodate the wartime efforts, there are also corresponding changes in labor policies. Um, these were all related to uh, expansion of war-related industries. There was transformation of small factories into subcontracting workshops. So for example, what this means is, let's say I own a textile factory that produces clothing. Well, at the height of the war, People are not focused on fashion. But what the Japanese Empire needs is uniforms for soldiers. So then I transform my clothes, my textile factory, and instead of producing clothing, I start producing uniforms. So this happened, this occurred um, quite frequently um, at the height of these wartime mobilization efforts. Um, but by the end of the colonial period, so with Japan's surrender at the end of World War II in August 1945, what we have in Korea then is just a, a very wide array of, of people with, with different experiences, uh, different colonial experiences. We have those who were landlords and capitalists and white collar workers and, and those individuals who um, actually fared, fared well for themselves during the colonial period uh, and, and were able to receive a Japanese colonial education, spoke Japanese and um, supported their families as a result. So we have those kinds of people. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have those who are landless peasants, those who had been mobilized, factory workers uh, as a result of the war, um, and um, tenant farmers, and many of these, particularly those, those factory workers that had been mobilized, many of them had been exposed to communist ideologies or communist ideas and had been radicalized by the colonial experience. And then of course, in between, there's just a wide range of, of 
people who um, you know, may not have had necessarily a, an overwhelming positive or overwhelming negative experience, but a mix of, of both. So you have the whole range of experiences among Koreans uh, at, at, uh, in August of 1945. How do you then unify all of these people? That becomes one of the critical questions for Koreans. So the Japanese have surrendered. They have to give up their colonies. Korea is going to get their independence. They want to establish their own government. They are not ready for self-rule. What does this new government look like? Who is going to lead it? These are, these are some of the most pressing questions of the time. So you have, you know, especially it, it becomes challenging when you have all of these different groups, those who are on the far right, those who are on the far left. Um, but but one, one of the things that most Koreans could agree upon was that they wanted to dismantle the colonial administration. So get rid of what the Japanese had, uh, particularly the police force. The police force because they had been so brutal, so oppressive, um, they wanted to get rid of that. And um, that was one of, one of the most pressing concerns at the time. Um, there were various political figures who emerged. Yeon Hyung was one who was very popular, um, becomes somewhat of a figurehead, and he, he insists that there be no foreign interference in the Korean process of trying to establish their own government, um, and wanted to prevent any collaborators, any those who had collaborated with the Japanese, particularly those um, who were more, most egregious in their collaboration, uh, wanted to uh, exclude those people from exercising their power. There was a committee for the preparation of Korean independence that was established that called for unity. So regardless of what your political ideology was, it called for unity. Uh, they called for nonviolence, and it, it turned into a temporary peacekeeping organization. And the branches of this, called People's Committees, then began emerging throughout the country. So these different People's Committees, uh, they incorporated youth groups, and student groups, and labor groups, and, and workers groups. And um, the, all of these people now, you see widespread political participation by Koreans, because everybody will now finally had an opportunity to, to have a political voice. And so um, within just a few weeks after independence, these people's committees sprouted up. Uh, about 145 of these existed nationwide. And so the, there was a, a convention that was held. Delegates from all of these different people's committees, they were sent up to Seoul. And the convention decided to establish the Korean People's Republic. And the Korean People's Republic was really a coalition government, trying to incorporate elements on the left and on the right. They called for widespread land reform. And this was something that the Koreans wanted from back in the Chosen Dynasty. So, so this was a really long time coming for most Koreans. They wanted widespread land reform. Um, they called for a nationalization of industries such as the banking industry or manufacturing. Those industries that had been controlled by the Japanese colonial state. So they want to nationalize this, um, promote commerce and industry, provide uh, for labor rights, so an eight hour workday, a minimum wage no child labor. These are all things that had been denied to them during the colonial period and that they, they wanted and they requested but were never given. Um, and then of course things like freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, again things that had been denied to them during the colonial period. So 
This was a part of their platform, the Korean People's Republic. Um, there was some confiscation of land that, of course, was opposed by those who owned land. Uh, but for the most part, the majority of Koreans supported this because um, the, the prevailing mood at the time was really revolutionary. And it was about dismantling the colonial administration and getting rid of that. Uh, but unfortunately, there were interests outside of Korea, um, particularly by the Russians and the Americans, on um, what was going to happen in Korea and the nature uh, of, of how, how, Korean, uh, uh, how Koreans were going to uh, go forward. So the Russians were interested because they shared the border in the, in the north uh, with Korea. Um, they had, as mentioned earlier, they had historically had an interest in Korea. Uh, and, and because the Americans knew this, they knew that the Russians would not agree to a unilateral administration, so they approached the Russians about establishing a multilateral administration. Uh, in the US, became interested in Korea because uh, now with what had happened with Japan and Pearl Harbor, uh, the security of Korea was important to the security of the Pacific and the security of America in general. Uh, and so, um, the, and, and then also the US was, was concerned about uh, the expanding Soviet influence in the area uh, and so the United States wanted to make sure that they had some kind of a presence in Korea. The United States developed a policy of trusteeship. Uh, this was the idea that the Koreans needed to be guided along, that they were not ready for governing themselves. And so the United States would then oversee this and help them along, and that they would eventually be given um, control over their government. Well, as you can imagine, the Koreans were resentful of the inference that they were not ready for self-government. They, they had um, already mobilized, they had um, established the CPKI and all these people's committees across the country, they had declared the establishment of the Korean People's Republic, uh, and so they were, were resentful of this, that, that the United States thought that they weren't ready. Um, nevertheless, 25,000 US soldiers were sent in to occupy the southern portion of Korea. Uh, and the Americans, when they, before they even arrived in Korea, uh, so, so military, the military, US military in Okinawa, Japan, uh, the Japanese there had informed the Americans that there were communist elements in Korea. And that this, this revolutionary mood uh, was, was tilted towards communism. And so the Americans were distrustful of the Koreans before they even arrived in Korea. Uh, they saw these people's committees, which were these organic um, committees that sprouted up all over the country. Again, they thought that it was communist. Um, but um, this really kind of sets up the dynamic between the American military uh, government and, and the Koreans when they arrived. Uh, they saw the ousting of landlords, attacks on former policemen, um, Americans, they thought that this was radical and they, this immediately became tied to the Soviet-American rivalry. Uh, and this just sets it up for the Cold War. So, uh, Korea being on the frontier of, of this was, um, it, it, it made Korea the focal point for Soviet and American interests on the peninsula. Now, when the Americans started to arrive in Korea, many of them um, dropped pamphlets from airplanes. 
um, to explain to Koreans what was going on. Uh, and so one of the pamphlets said, to the people of Korea, the armed forces of the United States will soon arrive in Korea for the purpose of receiving the surrender of the Japanese forces, enforcing the terms of surrender and ensuring the orderly administration and rehabilitation of the country. These missions will be carried out with a firm hand, but with a hand that will be guided by a nation whose long heritage of democracy has fostered a kindly feeling for people less fortunate. How well and how rapidly these tasks are carried out will depend upon the Koreans themselves. Hasty and ill-advised acts on the part of its residents will only result in unnecessary life, loss of life, desolation of your beautiful country, and delay in its rehabilitation. Present conditions may not be as you would like them. For the future of Korea, however, remain calm. Do not let your country be torn asunder by internal strife. Apply your energies to peaceful pursuits aimed at building a great country for the future. Full compliance with these instructions will hasten the rehabilitation of Korea and speed the day when the Koreans may once again enjoy life under a more democratic rule. How does this sound to you? How does this end? Why, why are you shaking your head? <laughs> Actually, I, um, I think that with that kind of letter, um, it's stating that they do not really want to help Korea, but it's more like um, an order. So the letter actually states the different parts. So I don't think that they really want to really help Korea, but they also want to enrich Korea. Very good. Yeah, it's, it's, it's rather aggressive. <laughs> Um, and forceful. Okay, so so the Soviets in the northern part of the peninsula, they did something similar. They were also dropping pamphlets to explain to the Koreans up there what was going on. And the Soviet pamphlets said, congratulations on your liberation. The people of the Soviet Union rejoice with you. For 36 years, the Japanese imperialists plundered Korean financial resources. Limit the freedom of speech, efface racial independence and national existence, pillage your language, and in addition, drag you into the war. But now you have been liberated from slavery under the Japanese oppression. The time for the Korean people to plan their own living has arrived. The Red Army has absolutely no intention to plunder, but rather to restore the independence of Korea. All private properties are under the reliable protection of the Red Army, so there is no cause for fear. We are not going to compel our principles of government on this land. Though we are establishing a democratic form of government here, you have the right to express your own point of view. Where would you rather live? Intention is the same, but much more so. So, so this is, this is, the situation at the end of 1945. Um, American policy, uh, again, because they were distrustful of the Koreans uh, when they first arrived in Korea, in the southern part of Korea, uh, the Korean People's Republic, which had been declared, was immediately outlawed. They thought it was communist front, so they said, no, you're not a legitimate uh, political government, so they outlawed. Uh, and instead was the United States Army military government in Korea uh, that was established, that it left the colonial administration intact and in fact resurrected some aspects of it, which as you can imagine, um, it, it, it stirred up quite a bit of bitterness and resentment among the Koreans um, because first thing that they wanted to do was to tear it down and here the Americans come in and they bring it back. Uh, if you look at these pictures, so which flag is this right here? Okay, this is the Japanese flag. So we see in front of the Japanese colonial administrative building that the Japanese flag is being lowered. And then the, which flag is this? The U.S. flag is being raised. Um, for many Koreans, this was just 
the substitution of one colonial for another. Uh, uh, so again, you know, quite a bit of resentment here in Korea. Uh, the problems with with this have been uh, some of the, the more extreme ones were that the United States really the Americans ignored the problem of collaboration, uh, and they they brought they resurrected the colonial administrative structure for the sake of administrative efficiency. Well, it's there, it's intact, um, let's continue to use it. And then uh, the Americans also favored the Korean Democratic Party, which was um, a party made up of property-owning, English-speaking, anti-communist individuals. Um, for the Americans, they appeared middle class, but they were in fact really upper class. And um, this party was very active in dismantling and eliminating the people's committees that had um, sprung up across the country. It was very conservative, rather reactionary. Um, in the South, you know, because there was quite a bit of labor unrest and um, those that had been uh, radicalized by the colonial experience, um, we see quite a bit of um, social discontent. Um, many of these strikes and demonstrations were put down by the National Police and assisted by American troops. Um, the Koreans wanted land reform. Well, they only, they only um, implemented very limited land reform. Um, the Soviets in the north, uh, they, they tried to stay mostly in the background. They allow the process of de-Japanization occur, this means dismantling the colonial administration, uh, as well as the social revolution, because this was in line with their agenda and with their ideals. And so they allowed that process to occur. Uh, they kept a guiding hand at the top, but in March 1946, they implemented sweeping land reform, again, very appealing to the Korean government. Um, so in the north, what we saw was the establishment of a very cost-effective uh, system that met the desires of the masses. So it's the majority of what what Koreans wanted. It created a very friendly border state for for the Soviets. Um, and what emerged were four different political parties in the north. There were Kim Il Sung and his allies. There were the Yemen allied forces who um, had, uh, had been active in China. And then there were Koreans from the Soviet Union, those who had immigrated to the Soviet Union and came back after liberation. And then other domestic leftists and communists who had stayed in Korea during the colonial period. But the results were that foreign occupation did not end. By the end of 1946, there was this consolidation of the North and the South, and in 1947, Washington is willing to officially acknowledge the existence of the Cold War. So Truman, President Truman, he develops something that is called containment policy, which means that communism needs to be contained, so not allowed to spread. South Korea being on the frontier of this, becomes very strategic and imperative that South Korea remain um, the, the bulwark for containing communism. Uh, and so the United States turned to the United Nations for support and decided to hold political elections in the southern part of the peninsula. The UN Temporary Commission on Korea is created and elections in the South were held in May of 1948, where Sigmund Rhee was elected as the first president of the Republic of Korea. Pyongyang in the North, of course, protested this, said, UN has no authority to hold these elections. We do not acknowledge this. We do not recognize. Uh, the Republic of Korea, and they respond by holding their own elections in August. And as a result of those elections, Kim Il-sung is elected as the first premier of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea.
bring us. So now we have formal establishment of separate regimes in Korea, in the north and in the south. Um, the Soviets first would draw their troops from the northern part of the peninsula, followed a little later by the American withdrawal from the south, and this sets up the scene for civil war, which occurred between 1950 and 1953. So again, you know, there's still quite a bit of, of unrest within the South. Um, many Korean veterans of the Chinese Civil War, tens of thousands of these, these soldiers had returned um, from China, and many of them ended up in the North. The North Koreans had, had feared a preemptive attack by the South, uh, and so Kim Il-sung had spoken with Stalin and Song, kind of giving this green light, but yeah, go ahead. And so in 1950, North Korea attacks South Korea. Um, they were able to take Seoul within three days. Uh, troops came down, they attacked Seoul. The, the government is forced to move down to the southernmost per perimeter of the peninsula. So because the South was not able to, to militarily defend themselves, the U.S. under U.N. forces, they decided to move it. And so in September, General MacArthur arrives, throws, he launches an assault on Incheon, where Seoul is retaken. He pushes North Korean soldiers all the way up to the Yalu River, which is the northernmost border in China. Uh, however, in late November, hundreds of thousands of Chinese troops arrived. <laughs> and so uh, they push back the, the UN forces, and there is this uh, back and forth. Um, Seoul falls again, the UN forces capture it, um, and eventually there is a stalemate, two years of negotiation, and finally a truce that is signed in 1953. So, as um, you're probably aware, given that there are you know, recent events with North and South Korea resuming talks with each other and Kim Jong un meeting Donald Trump in Singapore, um, one of the issues that has been discussed was the signing of a peace treaty because a peace treaty was never signed between the two countries and technically are still at a state of war. So, uh, even though there was a truce that was signed, no peace treaty was signed. But the total of the war, um, it's, it's really uh, quite tragic for, for what happened. Not just because millions of people died uh, during this war, but um, we had North Koreans, committing atrocities against South Koreans, South Koreans committing atrocities against North Koreans, neighbors committing atrocities against each other, uh, and it created this, this heightened sense of paranoia. Um, and you couldn't trust anybody. Just the accusation of being communist in South Korea could be you and your entire family executed. So, so um, there, there was that sense of hatred between the two Koreas and, and distrust between the two. Um, much of the infrastructure that had been developed during the colonial period, one third of it was destroyed. Um, much of the manufacturing that had also been developed during the colonial period, a half, half of it was destroyed. Arable land and housing, half of it was destroyed. Uh, not to mention the chaos and the turmoil of refugees fleeing up and down the peninsula trying to avoid um, the, the battles and, and the destruction and the death. So this, this the Korean War has um, 
it, it really caused a kind of trauma that um, has affected many generations in Korea, both in the North and in the South, and still has an influence today, and which is why it has been a very long road to recovery and for relations between the two countries. Okay, so as mentioned, in South Korea, the, the elections had occurred with Sun Rhee as the first president. Sun Rhee was 73 years old when he was elected president. This is not a young man. Uh, he had spent most of his adult life in the United States. Uh, he, he immigrated there, he was educated there, he received his PhD from Princeton. He was a Christian convert. Uh, so even though he was very familiar with, with the American way of life and had been thoroughly educated uh, in the American educational system, when he became president, he acted like a late Joseph dynasty monarch. And even though he had inherited this uh, democratic form of government, uh, his ambition for personal power um, really superseded everything and he began to dismantle it in order to um, amass his own personal power. He passed the national, uh, in the National Assembly in you know, November of 1940, something that was called the National Security Law, which defined sedition or um, opposition to the government. It defined sedition in such a broad way that he was able to use this law in order to suppress uh, much of the political opposition to him. Um, by 1950, there were about 60,000 prisoners, and many of these had been, many of these had been um, in prison or accused of violating the national security law. In 1952, he had up for re-election. He had pushed through certain constitutional amendments and enforced martial law um, and was re-elected in 1952. Uh, he continued to push amendments in 1954. So for example, uh, just like the American system where the U.S. president is limited to two terms, two four-year terms. Sigmund Ray said, well, these are exceptional times. We've just come off of the Korean War, and so there should be a special exemption for myself. I should be able to serve another term as president. He was able to force through uh, amendments through the National Assembly in order to uh, extend his presidency. And he had also created a nationwide police surveillance in order to, again, keep checks on political opposition. Uh, and, and this police surveillance included game, games of thugs who would go out and physically intimidate, if not beat, into submission. Um, so he's able to gain a majority in the National Assembly, you know, bribery threats, uh, national police, and he obviously did not have a strong, powerful um, popular base. Uh, and then he was able to consolidate power during his, his financial control, as you can imagine. Uh, there was a substantial amount of American financial aid being infused into South Korea. And he had control interests, and he had control over the distribution of property, so former colonial properties, um, who they would go to and how they would be used. Um, and then he also was able to eliminate many of his competitors. Um, some of his, his, those who were opposed to him, uh, many of them fled the country, some of them went up to North Korea, some of them died of injuries or illness during the Korean War, or others were simply executed or mysteriously disappeared. Uh, so he, he used the 
systematically eliminate his, his competition. By 1940, now he's up for his fourth election. And he wins the presidency. Question over the vice presidential candidate, um, but there, by this time there is quite a bit of discontent uh, amongst and opposition to Sidney Um This is obviously not a, a democracy or not the kind of democracy that the Koreans had expected uh, to be established, and um, as a result of Increasing education, increasing literacy, uh, communications. Uh, we see that the student movements uh, start to spread and become very active in their opposition to synagogue. Um, there are also very social factors that contribute to this, including um, uh, the too many university graduates. Enrollments in schools had increased by a factor of 12, but 60 percent of these graduates found difficult, difficulty in gaining employment. Uh, the spark of the 1960 revolution was there was a, a large demonstration down in Mata, and a 17-year-old boy who had participated in this demonstration had been struck by a tear gas canister thrown by the police and had died. And his body was then dumped into the bay in order to cover up what the police had done. But when the body was discovered and it, it was found out what had happened, um, that he had been killed during this demonstration, this was, was the spark of the 1960 revolution. So on April 18, 1960, 3,000 Korean university students by my university, they took to the streets peacefully to demonstrate, and they were met by Simon Rees, um, by the National Police, and by these gangs of thugs, and they were forcefully beaten and um, forced to retreat. So the following day, on April 19th, 30,000 university students now in Seoul gathered to demonstrate against Sigmund Rhee and started marching towards the Blue House, which is where the president lives. Peaceful, unarmed demonstration. But once they reached the Blue House, they were fired upon. And over 100 students died, about 1,000 students were killed. If you go to the April 19th memorial where there are the graves of those students who were killed during this, um, during this attack, um, there, are, there are even some elementary school students who, were, who died during this demonstration. Um, and so, Obviously, the shooting of peaceful students, um, this, the U.S. publicly condemned this, widespread demands for Sidney Marie's resignation. Finally, on April 25th, about 300 university professors gathered, demonstrated in front of the National, of the National Assembly, calling for, again, Sidney Marie to step down, which he finally did. So, so he was in Rolfe, 1948 to 1960, um, quite a long time. He finally uh, resigned, but in 1960, South Korea economically was not doing well. In fact, the North Korean economy was doing much better than the South Korean economy. Um, and so there was, there was widespread discontent over this and the economic difficulties that accompanied it. Um, so Kim Jong-il and Park jong my uh, military general. They staged a coup d'etat in 1961, established an authoritarian regime. Uh, they 
Hakjani had this vision of developing wealth and power through economic development, um, but this was extremely authoritarian, top-down, state-led uh, development. So he ruled through the Supreme Council for National Reconstruction <coughs> for the first two years, declared martial law, um, censorship of the press. There was no political activity whatsoever. And then he uh, established the Korean Central Intelligence Agency, which he used, again, to suppress political opposition. Um, due to pressure within Korea and also from the United States, who wanted a return to civilian rule, uh, 1962 martial law was lifted. Um, but during this period is when Park chun started to push for export-led industrial growth. Um, but still, there was, there was quite a bit of control over political dissent. Uh, the Constitution was suspended in 1972. If you go to the Constitutional Court uh, or the National Assembly in Korea, you see the timeline. There are the gaps of when either the National Assembly didn't exist or the Constitution was suspended. And, and, and this is largely because of what occurred during the Syngman Rhee and Park Jong-un. But Park Jong-un established where he declared the Yushin Constitution, which basically made the presidency a legal dictatorship. So he personally was able to appoint one third of the National Assembly. Uh, he had full control of the military. Uh, and um, I don't know if you've traveled to Korea before, but this, this is what the Han River, along the Han River, used to look like. Uh, and so he uh, got rid of all of this and uh, was determined to modernize and to develop Korea. But um, you know, this, this came at a great cost. So um, my department, we took our students to a coal mining factory um, out in the provinces. And there's, there's a, one part of Kangwon province is, is rich in coal. And so this side is now defunct. But um, it's, you, there are these testimonies of these coal miners who were forced to work very, very long days, 12, 14, 16 hour shifts. Uh, they were not compensated for their overtime, they still received the same pay. Uh, the safety standards are really worth that many. Uh, and so if you're a coal miner and you, your arm gets chopped off, that's it, you're done. Because there's a long line of other people to replace you. Um, so yes, absolutely, Korea was able to develop uh, and then eventually to <coughs> supersede the North Korean economy. Now Korea is what, the 12th or 13th largest economy in the world. And so great economic achievements uh, occurred, but uh, there's also a, a dark side to what happened. Um, and then we have, following the assassination of Park chung hee uh, another military coup d'etat by chun hee and so um, we don't see a, a real democratic form of government in the sense that we, that we understand today. That does not occur until the 1990s. So South Korea is actually a very young democracy. And it has gone through a very turbulent, violent, bloody democratization. Something that is familiar to you. Um, and so I, I hope that, I know that this is, this is a lot of information. Um, so I apologize if I've inundated you with, with too much information. Um, but I hope that you can see sort of the broad strokes of, of what has occurred in modern Korean history. I, I'll end my lecture here because Professor Lee is very capable of hands. 
aspects of this and other sessions. Um, but uh, I hope I hope that this gives you an idea and then also some ideas for how you can draw parallels and comparisons to um, the history of the Philippines and modern history. Okay, so um, if you have any questions, I, I'd be happy to answer any of them.